Hey there, my essential oil friends. This is PJ Hanks, and I'm happy in this video to share with you a recording from a class I did with my dear friend, Natalie Harris, who shared with us how to use essential oils in the garden. Natalie is a master gardener and has done a fabulous job in sharing with us how to use those precious oils to keep pests away, help our plants grow, and to have a flourishing garden. So I want to thank her for doing that. Now keep in mind that uh, she had some technical difficulties and so the slides aren't completely full screen, but you'll still be able to get the recipes and take the screenshots that you needed. And just as a reminder, please subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you'll be notified when I post more great videos here about using essential oils some technical difficulties with their screen so you're just going to get it to watch it in this view if that's okay i'm so sorry <laughs> it's all right it's going to be awesome it are it is uh, this is like there's so many things i love it's kind of stupid but um when pj talked about her and i falling in love um while i appreciate people this is kind of embarrassing to admit I don't really love a lot of people. This is going to make me emotional. I prefer plants and things. <laughs> I prefer baby bunnies and kittens and puppies and babies and 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 people till they're about 12, unless they're my grandchildren and I like them forever. Um, but um, early in life, I just had an affinity and the miracle, the sheer miracle. I remember in the third grade, Mrs. Parr gave us a bean to sprout. And she had us put it in a bag in a, um, it wasn't a Ziploc bag even, they didn't have a Ziploc, this tells you how old I am, it, but it was the one that had the fold over top and we had to rubber band the top so that with a couple drops of water and it sprouted and that was it, I was gone. I wanted to grow all the things, I wanted all the seeds when I made the connection that I could grow anything that had a seed. Um, and then it was really, and, and an interesting fact, I haven't had my own yard for 10 years now since I've been divorced. And I am deeply on the hunt for a home because my fingers are just itching for soil. But what I do is I do all my friends' yards and they're so happy I don't have my own house. <laughs> but with that said, um, I also have no idea what spectrum you're on. So when you become a master gardener, there's all these things you have to know. And it's kind of like, sometimes you can know too much if that makes any sense. And you can really scare people or just, I, I tried to pare it down. Um, if I go too fast, tell me, there's no screen on here that I didn't steal from somebody else. My original presentation is in somewhere in the ether. So I had to reconstruct this. And I actually think it was better because I think it's more simple. But um, I don't know about those of you but when the seed catalog comes, do, do any of your heart start palpitating and you drop whatever you're doing and you're just like, what are the new seeds for the year? You know, what are the annuals? What new varieties of perennials? So I, and I especially, I found some really funny things. So first we look at our seeds and then we buy some more seeds and next we buy even more seeds, but then we buy the plant started. <laughs> and I want you to know, PJ, that your cilantro, when it's baby like that, it is very tender. And if it wasn't put immediately into a good place, it would have a hard time thriving. So that wasn't necessarily your fault. And so this is for PJ. $8 for plants, she'll kill in one week. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that hysterical? Plant she'll kill in three weeks or 15 plants she'll kill in two months, 25. Um, it, that has always been a mystery to me, people killing plants. Um, but I have a sister who does it continually. So some of us just came here to do some things. And PJ came here to do oils. And I came here to um, copy and borrow from her about the oils. But the plant thing, you know, people talk about having a green thumb. I came here with one. And I don't know how I intuitively know what to do with them. But I just do. And it doesn't matter if you're the, this guy or if you're this gal we got you we got you there are some really basic principles and it is just fascinating to be able to use essential oils something else we love in connection with another thing that we love so um tonight just the really basic i know this is probably just a no-brainer to you but a lot of people don't think about this this is a soil map across the united states and then this says know your soil six different types of soil 
um, just like your body with an essential oil. What your when your body is out in the world, um, the stressors that it comes across are the very things that strengthen it for you to become who you're going to become. The stressors are the very things that weaken us to become what we're going to become. So this body and our soil is everything in our growth. And you can have all members of the same family, right? But you can get some really different personality, com com you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So you can literally plant four zucchini plants in the same bed and get totally different looking plants depending on how they've been treated. Because believe it or not, two feet or three feet away, you can have completely different soil. So the thing I wanna show you about tonight and, and what makes the difference mostly in soil, it is things like lime and how much clay, how much silt, how much sand, but the greatest thing of all is water. And what are we always saying to people before we even want to talk to them about oils? What do we say? Are you drinking enough? That's one of our very first questions. You have to be hydrated. Now with plants, because they've been growing indigenously, some of them only can't have too much water. Their soil can't be too wet or too dry. But we're going to take care of all of those ifs by no matter where you're coming to from in the world tonight. There's this site called the USDA Natural Resources Con um, Conservation Service. And do you see right here? Soil education. You can go in there, type in the area of the country that you're from, and it will give you a diagnosis. But don't go there unless you're having problems. I want you to assume that your soil is perfect until you grow something and start having issues and then we'll diagnose the soil, just like people are perfect. Now, another thing when it talked about seeds or even starting plants as they're started, you cannot go wrong. I'm sure you've probably seen this idea before, but if you start your seeds, and I usually do a lot smaller holes than that, I usually get six down each side, depending on what I'm what, what I'm starting. And then when it's time to put them in the ground, I literally take a big gardening knife and I saw it like a, like a cake. And I just take the chunks and put the chunks in whatever is the original soil. That helps to keep the plants from like, um, being in too great of shock, but you also know they started out with the nutrients they needed. A good start is everything for everybody. And it will stay as, as it goes out of that root um, dirt and into the regular soil. It will have a much easier time adjusting. Not everybody has that luxury, nor do they need it. Um, this is another idea that's become super popular in the last few years. It's called um, straw bale garden gardening and this is particularly um fruitful for areas that are like in a desert or if you just have really bad soil and it would cost you a lot a lot of money to bring in the soil you needed to garden well um all the details on how to do that are there um i don't know if you guys have ever seen these big pumpkins like this is we'll have weird dreams this is one of mine i want to marry a man who's as excited about big pumpkins as i am um these literally start in a sack of steer manure and a pumpkin like this will have multiple layers of manure and typically it'll go steer goat horse chicken and they prepare the beds for this so that when the roots go down because it's just massive massive nutrient right there's a lot of chemical stuff going on there but this is just to give you an idea of how important it is but tonight i want you to stick with the idea that no matter where you are if you just have that bag and you have your seeds your pot of plants you're going to do just fine this is an idea if you want to grow big pumpkins with me you call, you call me because next year i will have big pumpkins they have to have a certain amount of growing time as well you have to start them earlier than your regular ones and there are certain seeds, you have to buy certain seeds to get them this large from pumpkins that are that large, right? So seeds are also everything. Um, this is a tip that I love. Um, I was on a, a class once and somebody said, well, what do you do if you don't drink coffee? Well, you don't do this. But if you do drink coffee, don't waste your grounds anymore. You add your used coffee grounds to the soil. You rinse them first. You just take them in a regular strainer and rinse them. That's to get a lot of the acid out. 
or without rinsing them, you use them to provide an acidic boost to plants that love a lower pH, like maidenhair ferns, azaleas, and blueberries. Now, this is way more for like a Florida, oops, a Florida area. You guys have, you guys have blueberries. You guys have azaleas, PJ, up there? Okay, yeah, so you would probably, this is something you would really want to do. There's all kinds of things you can do to add to the soil, but never fear. If you have really bad soil, guess what? Nasturtiums love it. People who have bad soil are always saying, I can't grow anything. This is horrible. I say, plant nasturtiums. And by the third year, your soil will have beefed up. So um, when the nasturtiums die, the chemical uh, components of the leaves and the flowers will mix with that soil to make it fantastic. So the good thing about nasturtiums is why you've got really bad pH, really bad soil, they'll grow like crazy. But then after three or four years, you'll be going, I used to grow really great nasturtiums here. Now they, they just, they're horrible. It's because the soil got better from the nasturtiums themselves. They heal soil. I'm sure most of you have talked about composting. So composting is when you take all your table scraps, yes, meat, all, all your edible, table scraps, oil, all your ta edible table scraps. And there's a whole bit, bunch of different ways to compost, but this is to help you create new soil. So composting is a controlled aerobic oxygen required process that converts organic material into a nutrient rich soil amendment or mulch through natural decom decomposition. The end product is compost, a dark, crumbly, earthy smelling material. Now, when you're creating your compost, it usually stinks to high heaven. So wherever you're going to do it, you want to usually do it in like the back corner of your yard. Some people actually buy tumblers to do it, but this is something you can do that's really simple um, to help amend your soil just to every year make your soil better and better. Now, there are other things you can do. If you're doing a garden where you have rows, in between the rows, it's not as common now, right? Most of us don't get a newspaper, another society change. But we used to take all of our advertising newspapers and lay them in between the rows to keep the weeds down, put the grass clippings on top, that keeps the weed down and it's an awesome, awesome compost. And at the end of the year, you can just till it all in and, and it's amazing what good that adds also your leaves at the end of the year you can also put those on top of the grass compost so when you look at it depending on how many leaves you have in your yard you would see just like you would only see like leaves everywhere and you take the tiller you don't till it heavy you till it light because you want this air working in there right and then you you just let it set until spring and it's amazing what can happen in one winter's time by trying to compost and Composting obviously can be a whole class of its own. And so YouTube and Google is your best friend. And like here, the art of lazy composting. I'm just gonna tell you, people buy these really ornate systems with the drums that they roll, cost them thousands of dollars to do their compost. I promise you, and especially if you have chickens. But it, it's hard not to give the chickens all the scraps because they'll eat everything though, but there are certain things chickens shouldn't have. Put all those things behind the chicken coop and just keep having, when you clean out that chicken coop, whether you line it with sawdust or rot, whatever you line it with, empty it all on top of the compost and anything else. And even say to your neighbors, hey, when you have watermelon rinds or if you want to save your scraps for me, I'll put them back there and you just keep piling them on top of each other. You get a pitchfork and you turn it over once a week. The reason you don't want to turn it over more than once a week is because you need to let it get, you needs to have time to sit and decompose. Okay, so we're going to be talking a lot about bugs tonight and little critters that are rough on the garden, but this is one that you absolutely want. You can buy earthworms at any garden shop, but my bet is, is that you have your own. So another thing you can do is take a tray, any, any kind of a um, a bin, like a cat litter tub that about that size, dirt from your own garden. See if you can't find a couple of native worms hanging around, e even if it's like under your rose bushes or something you already have in your yard, 
You only need one or two. You can't believe how quickly they'll breed. And then maybe some coffee grounds. You're going to get it wet and dark and just put like newspapers or old trash mail on top. Now, if the old trash mail has those plastic windows, please take those out um, because there are components in there. You know, just rip it off the envelope. That's that's actually really not good for the soil. But um, earthworms till and enrich the soil where they live. It continually ingests decomposes and deposits casts the richest and finest quality of all humus material you're gonna you you're gonna become a worm freak if you're a gardener because every time you see a good group of worms you're like oh this this is where i'm going to plant whatever your favorite crop is right i typically like to do potatoes where i have a big where i found a big gathering of worms because potatoes get bigger the more air they have to breathe okay so now that we're talking about bugs, um, people just forget. Oh, I probably put that in the wrong place, but people are like, I just don't want all these bugs in my garden. Well, that's not true. It's you want them because if you let me just find this slide where I got it. Where how far down here is it? I'm probably sure. Oh, if something is not eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And really, if you have bugs, it's a very good sign because that means that things are healthy where you are. And um, there's a guy at the end, I've listed the podcast. So I happen to be a podcast freak, but Joe the Gardener, I don't know how many of you have listened to Joe the Gardener on the podcast, but he just talks about how everybody wants to have these backyard oasises with the trees and the flowers and the, and none of us want bugs. Well, that ain't going to happen if your trees and everything's healthy, right? You're going to have some stuff. Might I refer us back to essential oils in our human body? Even the most beautiful, healthy bodies need to have their stuff, right? How many of you heard that you need to have a really good cold once a year? Because the same antibodies that make your body fight off cancer are the very same antibodies that fight off a cold. So often you will hear people say who have come down with cancer, I've never been sick. I just don't understand this. They didn't have the right antibodies. So building antibodies and even rotten things like viruses are actually good for us and good for mankind. And we need bugs in our garden. Another, for those of us who love gardens, we typically like birds too. We have a bird thing going on and you can't have birds without the bugs. And we think it's so funny. Um, you can't imagine how many caterpillars it takes a day for a bird to stay alive. It, it's not 20, it's hundreds and sometimes thousands. So some people, it just freaks them out when they start thinking about what's really in their yard at one time. But you want them and you, you just want to keep the ecosystem going. Now, there's th this is an article that I really like, 10 insect eating birds to attract to your garden. And I'm just going to tell you like cardinals and blue jays. And yes, um, you, everybody gives crows and ravens a really hard time. But if you have crows and ravens, that means you probably have a good habitat going because you have enough to keep them around to keep them fed. Um, crows are a whole nother thing. I hope that you'll watch the crow special on uh, Netflix. They are so ridiculously intelligent. If you are not kind to them, they will poop on you and poop on your car. Go watch the documentation. You're just, it, it, anyway. So there are things that you can do. Your garden is one of the greatest things to bring, to bring birds to you to keep your house. I wanted to throw this in because I said those of us who like gardening, most of us end up with a chicken thing going on sometime in the whole part of that because we can't help ourselves. We want Easter every day. There is a whole class on nine essential oils for chickens and how to use them. Just throwing it out there in case you want to have access to that. Um, the other thing about a garden is just the sheer magic that happens there. So this is my grandson. This is him on Saturday. If you don't know this and you're a grandmother or you're a mother, you want to do this. I do it every year. I buy each family um, at your garden centers. They will have the they'll have the caterpillars for you, and they come in these this little net. Actually, they don't. They come in this little cup with all the food they're going to eat. So you get to watch them eat the food for like eight to ten days. You watch watch them get fat. They hang to the top. You take it off the top of the cup, put it inside this thing. And then with less than two weeks later, voila, uh, usually they sell them in groups of five, only four of ours hatched. 
Um, but yeah, do you see that smile on that face? These are memories. And not only are they memories, but butterflies are pollinators. And they come out in the early hatch of the year to help you get um, your garden pollinated. Um, so I love this too. Excuse me, I ordered a dozen bees, but you gave me 13. That's a freebie. Ha -ha. And then down here, she's a keeper. Beekeeper, get it? Huh? I loved it. Anyway. Okay. And then just a note, because I'm totally also a bee freak. Um, this is a real bee. It's a native Australia. We don't see them here, but especially being a lot of us doTERRAites, I just love that it only loves lavender flowers, doesn't pollinate anything else. Okay, another thing that's really, really necessary for our garden is ladybugs. You can also buy these at the garden center. So right now you're probably thinking, why are you telling me about the oils? Why are you telling me about I'm getting there? But first we have to have a basis. Believe it or not, see these little, you've seen how tall a ladybug is, right? You can't believe how much a ladybug poops in a day because, um, let's go, Bene ladybugs are beneficial insects that play a major role in keeping down populations of insects that feed on plants. Perhaps most importantly, ladybugs are predators with an insatiable appetite for aphids. I'm sure you've all seen aphids on a rose bush, and if you haven't, I hope you've seen them somewhere because they are massive. A ladybug can eat up to 5,000 aphids over its lifetime. That's a lot of poop people. And you know what their poop is doing? It's fertilizing your garden. Yeah. And the actual ladybug shell, when they do die, its actual body, the mineral composition is like magic fertilizer for the soul. I, I just love our world and our planet. Okay. So now here we go. So in order to get um, pollinators, um, ladybugs, bees, butterflies, all of the things. Lavender attracts the natural pollinators. And you're like, oh, well, how do you do that? Here is your pollinator party spray. Six to eight drops of lavender, six to eight drops of orange. I use wild orange. Four ounces of distilled water. You mix together in a four ounce glass spray bottle. Shake before each use and then just go around and spray the plants. It, you, it doesn't it, you do not have to like spray the entire plant. You just go squirt, squirt, squirt because they're essential oils. They're a natural product. That oil, that mist, when it hits the leaves, the plant is going to absorb it in and then that becomes part of its natural pheromone and that will bring it in. So you don't have to spray it like six or eight times. It's literally like every, I would say every, Mm, three weeks. Anyway, I think that this is one of my favorite recipes for the beginning of a garden, but I also probably wouldn't spray it until the plant was fairly established. I would want it to have um, five leaf casings spread out before that type of a thing. Um, there's other, there's also, okay, so right, so we've talked about the good bugs, right, that help us well, we all know that there's the bugs that are just really, um, that will eat our, our plenty. And I wanted to talk about the three sisters for a couple of reasons. One, because I freaking love our Indian ancestors. And we have, um, there's history dating, oh, right here, practiced by the Iroquois since the 1300s. When the Indians planted, they planted a third for themselves to consume at the moment, a third to be consumed over the duration till the next planting. And then a third they gave back to the land. So they absolutely understood the importance of what the deteriorating plant product did. And then they also, you know, how um, in the United States we have over guarded certain crops, they would move like with the sundial around, but there's something called the three sisters companion planting. So it provides soil fertility and healthy diet from a single planting. Corn planted in the center offers support for the pole beans and the beans add nutrient nitrogen to the soil. Nitrogen, if you haven't played with nitrogen in your garden, I'm going to say right now, put in big letters, Google nitrogen, and then like put it on a zucchini put it on anything and see the difference in size from what you normally get 
to the size it will it, it's just going to blow up your vegetables i mean literally like your peppers are going to be peppers and your pumpkins are going to be pumpkins and your zucchinis you know zucchini the reason i say zucchinis is because they get crazy anyway but you put some nitrogen on some zucchini zucchini sister and you're going to have the biggest you can probably hollow it out and paddle across the pond um and then finally the squash it leaves the leaves cool the soil that the on top of the um pole beans and the corn um and it keeps it keeps the weeds down so if you haven't three sister planted before the corn the beans and the squash i think that would be a really fun thing for you to do and um it's just fun to well for me to just see these um ancient ways and how brilliant they actually are even in today's technology farmers have found that they they can get way more um crop what is it um you know way more corn way more beans way more if they plant this way rather than just doing a single harvest now um there's the reason we're talking about companion planting so that was that was to restore the soil all of that kind of thing but also um there are companion plantings that you can do to keep away pests, to keep away the bugs. And basil is like this massive, ba if you need to know what oil you need for, um, well, there's a couple, but basil, you got to have basil. Put that on your list right now today, especially if you have house plants. And if you ever get those little gnat flies that fly around, we're going to get to a spray for that in a minute. Basil, basil, basil. Um, this is a great companion to plant with tomatoes. Um, not only, okay, let me just read this because it's good information. Add basil essential oil in your watering can to give the plants a dose that can be absorbed through the root system. So you want it to go to the root and, and you can also put it in a spray for the leaves. It's great for plant vigor growth and it's, it helps to keep pests away. And then I've included this chart in here for really good companion planting and every it's it's just like magic in the world right every if it's a if it's a good combination not only does it fertilize the soil and strengthen your fruit production um it also keeps all the pests away i i just think i just love how nature's magic okay this, this is where the thing is if something is not eating your garden your plants then your garden is not part of the ecosystem now i know this is going to sound crazy to you but most master gardeners are and a lot of it comes from them being by themselves a lot outside in the dirt. Um, and I think most of you know that soil actually has serotonin in it, right? So it really does calm a person. So when people say, oh, I just have to get in the garden, it's they're wanting, they're wanting their serotonin fix. And naturally, it absorbs from the soil into our hands in a natural receiving process that really calms the soil. Um, now we're going to talk about, these are the different oils that you want for garden pests. So it says spiders, and then it says all of these. This is where I, ha I have three different um, slides for you, because when I found them, I liked different ones better for different reasons. Um, I'm going to tell you that I have seen caterpillars be extremely peppermint resistant. Most things are not um, peppermint resistant. Um, but I think peppermint must have been at the base of, uh, peppermint is awesome for like ant, but just not caterpillars. It, it's uh, the reason what I'm referring to is corn. You know, you go into check your ears of corn and they're, they're just all in there anyway. But I, part of what happens is, is when we use something against nature for a certain period of time, nature will come back. Nature will figure out its own antidote and come back. So for caterpillars, Peppermint's okay, but not not the strongest. Whereas cedar wood, cedar wood will take down your um, bed bugs, lice. I, I I always tell people you got you got to have at least ten bottles of cedar wood in your emergency kit. You got you got to have it in there because of the because of all the things it does. So look, you see for beetles, slugs, spiders, you see cedar wood on every one of these except for ants, and um ants typically live around wood so that's why that wouldn't be there aphids really aphid, aphids basil and rosemary i'm just going to go through and tell you really quick what i what i know to be true 
um, spiders, arborvitae. So is arborvitae only down here for mosquitoes and that? I, I use I use arborvitae a lot more than what this thing is showing. So we'll see. Um, mosquitoes, you know all the stuff for that. Ants, aphids, especially. We've got a we've, we've got a spray down here, so we'll come down. Here's another one. So tips and tricks: ants, peppermint, beetles, um, chiggers, cutworms, flies, mosquitoes, moths, spiders, ticks. This is an important one to note. Um, ticks really, really, really hate geranium. Isn't that interesting? Geranium is the oil for our blood, right? I'm pretty sure you're probably familiar with that. And ticks hate it. But um, that would be my first suggestion. You know, people always say, oh, put Franker on guard. No, you just go straight for the geranium. Put the geranium on top, smother it, and you'll see it. it it's going to get out of there. It can't stand it. Um, and weevils, I haven't ever had to deal with them because I, I haven't lived in the South since I was 18, but I've heard that cedar wood's really good for that. So like having cedar wood planks in your actual pantry where you're storing your flowers, but also you can diffuse it in there and they say, just do it like once a week and it'll, it'll keep them from hatching and keep them from getting out of there. Here's one more final. Um, I really liked this. Um, because I'm a visual girl. Oh, fleas. Um, for those of you who have dogs, um, you know, I also think it's interesting. Rosemary is what we use to increase hair growth. Rosemary is the thing. If you're giving your dogs a bath and you've just, you know, been on a trail, make sure you put a couple of drops of rosemary in your hands before you're, you know, rubbing them down with the shampoo to get all the, to get the fleas out of there. Um, okay. Oh, fire ants. Now, this is another thing. I, I'm also trying to include things that I get a lot of questions about, even though um, we don't really have, it isn't that we don't have fire ants in Utah and Idaho. It's just that where we have fire ants, they're usually in the mountains up in the, you know, you'll come and you'll come across the big, huge pile, but these are also in the South. But you just, you put this together and you're thinking molasses. And you, this is another company, but I couldn't find um, one by doTERRA and I didn't want to remake the graphics so don't hate me um, but this this thieves to show is our on guard the molasses the molasses is to give it consistency but also the sweetness to to draw the ants to it ants have highly sensitive smell systems um, and then the wild orange and you there you go mix and pour on the ant mound um, this is the bug away spray this is the one I specifically use. I have it in a spray bottle and I spray it all around. I, you know, I don't know. I'll just turn this a little more. I, I don't know if you can see or not. Let's see. Well, I have, I have like, I think it's 62 plants in my house right now. That's what happens to a girl when you don't have your own dirt. You put it all in your house and all around you. But yeah, so I use this spray um, every Sunday. It's just kind of a thing I create. And I actually triple it. I have it in a big glass bottle and I just go around and spray just because I don't like all those little buggies that that come from it. Maybe you don't get those from where you are, but if you haven't experienced them, this is one of my this is one of my favorite recipes. Now, this is just a little bit different variation. Um, but what I want to point out is melaleuca, just like melaleuca is super fabulous for our skin. It's so great for all things fungal. If you have a tomato plant, any, any kind of mildew, um, you, you know, you can tell what, it, you can tell if a plant has a fungus. It's not always black. Lots of times it's white. Sometimes it's cream, but if it even kind of looks like a fungus, do this 30 drops of melaleuca mixed with a water spray. And then you just go around. Now, the difference, too, is you do not have to spray the entire plant. You're going to be like, this plant is so huge. Spray at the bottom towards the roots. Go up towards the bottom base of the plant and just spray around the bottom. You can spray the top if you want, but there's no reason to. Uh, it's going to do the job. It's, it's like when we take frankincense and we put it at the nape of our neck, right? We don't need to put it all over our body. You just want to get it at the top of the, um, oh, what do you call the, the spinal column sac. And so that's like that for the plants, except for we're, we're working bottom up. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. 
I, I just love this. Yesterday, I totally took this from a, a gal who's a doTERRA distributor. Yesterday, I just finished up getting the last of my garden beds ready for summer. And after giving them a good watering, I went around and sprayed my plants with a blend of these oils right here, lemongrass, geranium, frankincense. Now I want you to think about what lemongrass does. And I want you to think about what geranium does blood in our body. Frankincense, each of these oils have some special properties that encourage plant growth, especially in the early stages. Um, my recipe that I originally have, and I'm sorry, I couldn't find my original. It, it has one more thing in it, but when you have newbies, so like, I dare say if um, PJ had gotten a hold of her cilantro and sprayed it with this immediately, she probably could have gotten to come back. She, I, I bet she could have, um, especially in the early stages. So whether you have seed started seeds indoors or just starting out with smaller plants, that you are hoping to see grow, this will be a good blend to encourage growth. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave that there because you'll have access to this. Um, okay, let's go to no, let's see there. Okay, here we go. Um, we don't often talk about trees and um, bushes, but again, remember I told you about basil. I add 40 drops to a gallon of water and fertilize fruit trees or tomatoes. You know, have you ever seen people talk about how you put a banana peel in water and then you put that all over at the base of your tomatoes for a really good outcome, best, everything? This will this will outdo it times like a ton. Yeah, and it's just not, anyway, you're gonna love it. And if doTERRA ever has basil in the BOGO again, Get yourself a couple of bogos. This is another one I think you have to have on here. But um, I'm also going to talk about um, cinnamon because we haven't brought this one up yet. If you add five drops to a 16 ounce spray bottle and water and spray weeds regularly, and you know why, right? It's burning it. It's chemically burning it and it'll burn it from the inside out. It'll get on there. It'll go into the system, into the plants like respiratory system, and it'll it'll just burn it right up. And then down here is another pollinator spray. And I use wild orange and lavender. If you want to do it smaller, that's just a different one, but it's really close. So I wanted to give you, I wanted to show you some examples of some differences in plants. Now she didn't have this when it first came out, but she said, I quarantined this baby away from the garden since the wind can cause fungal spores to float to nearby plants. So I don't know if you know that, but if you have a plant, that is looking like it's got um, mildew or, or any kind of fungus all over it. Quarantining a plant is a really good idea. And it's just like what you would think, just like with us. In the, you dig it up, you put it in a pot and you move it like to the other side of the house. You wanna make sure it still has sun or whatever. Um, but so she took it and she sprayed it with this powdery, powdery mildew spray and look what happened. It came back. She thought it was dead. And it doesn't even, you can't even, you don't, you, there's no sign of distress on this plant, right? So she's got melaleuca and basil right there. So the melaleuca to take care of the fungus, the outer skin kind of thing, and the basil to get in there with the right chemical um, constituents to strengthen that plant that was struggling. So here's another mildew spray. For those of you who do um, tomatoes, um, this is, so it has, she also adds baking soda, a drop of dish soap to the water. And the reason they do the baking soap, the baking soda and the dish soap is to help it stick to the plant so that it's actually staying on the leaves longer. Okay, now this is one of my favorites. Um, for those of you who are gardeners, you have had this experience with, the, I don't know, those, well, that's a cucumber, not zucchinis, um, where you have little bunnies or rats, or that's one thing about the straw bale gardening that, um, that would make me hesitate to straw bale because that would be a haven for mice and rodents. Um, but mice and rodents also bring a lot of nutrition to your soil and to your garden. Um, anyway, so this is called the no nibbler spray, bunnies, all the different things. 10 drops rosemary, 10 drops peppermint, 10 drops thyme, and 10 drops clove. So we haven't really talked about thyme and clove yet. All of those oils right there are must have, must have. Now, remember before I said, you don't have to spray the plant like crazy. 
two or three good sprays on the plant will will bring the um, mist in the leaves will just soak it right up into its system and it will emit um, emit that smell okay so here's here's a good picture of some aphids um lemon water with oil in a spray garden bottle are a natural pesticide that kill aphids on contacts and leave your plants looking lovely so if you don't have ladybugs in your garden yet or anything as like if you have roses i wouldn't want to put clove oil um on my roses but i would put lemon oil on them any day so i just want to put that one in there um, okay, some of you, if you're familiar with gardening, these are the kind of questions I'm let you ask at the end to see if I, I, I am not a guru by any means, I just have loved it, but some people don't understand, they'll say, oh, I've got a fungus on my pepper, I just wanted you to know this is not a fungus, this is, um, as the peppers ripen, the chlorophyll will cause um, this color change, and, and you can pick it, dice it, and eat it just like that, and it is just fine for your body. Um, you'll also have peppers that maybe change color, like if you've ever bought a purple pepper or uh, uh, sometimes the red peppers, I don't usually go black first though, but just don't, on peppers, don't get worried. I always get a lot of questions about something's wrong with my peppers. Um, and then baking soda, this is, if, they, if, if cinnamon doesn't get it, which cinnamon should, if you just do a spray bottle of cinnamon, that recipe we had before, baking soda, it neutralizes the pH in the soil and nothing will grow there. So if any of you have a black walnut tree and you've thought, why can't I grow hostas under here? Why can't my, why won't my grass grow? It's because of the pH in the soil from the black walnuts. So this is the exact same thing that happens with, um, with weeds when you put the baking soda on it and as it says here use it around the edges of the flower beds to keep the grass and weeds from growing into the beds just sprinkle it onto the soil so that it covers it lightly do this twice a year spring and fall but i do want to remind you you want to be super careful and not put it places that you might want to grow the soil want to grow something because eventually if it's had too much to actually kill the ph then if you do want to grow something there, you're going to have to take out a couple of inches of your top soil and probably spend a year in good soil prep getting something to grow there. So just be careful when you're doing it. Um, I love this too. Um, when um, Carol Ann Jones, I don't, she was thinking she might be here on here tonight, but she's the one who taught me this. Because you know, you come in and you got stuff all over your tools and you're just like, oh, I don't want to have to go. You just have a spray bottle and you spray them off. It's got 10 drops of Melaleuca and you and you just spray them and you'll see it just like drops off and you and then you just put your tools on the shelf. Um, I wanted to talk about cedar wood. That's why I have this on here. Cedar wood chips um, are very, depending on how wealthy you are, um, or want to be for your garden cedar wood chips are super super great they actually have to be careful where you get them because just it, it deters pests and sometimes it can deter plant growth depending on how heavy of a depending on what you're trying to grow and what the ph needs to be but like if you if if i were doing a straw bale um garden i would definitely line in between the rows the cedar chips to keep the rats and the mice out neem oil has a lot of tree properties, um, but it also helps deter pests. It's it's really good for corn and squash. I've already talked about companion planting. Oh, and I just, oops, I liked, um, I wanted to talk about, um, for those of you who know what, um, oh my gosh, what is it that she was addressing here? Oh, the little, the little mites. Are any of you familiar with the plant mites? Okay, they can be a booger to get rid of because they're so tiny and they breed by literally the hundred thousands. And so you, um, sometimes like if you have a greenhouse, this is another super common question that I wish I do to get, to get rid of them. Sometimes you have to take everything out, soil and all, spray it down with the oil, let it set for a season or at least a couple of weeks, get some good sunshine in there. Um, and then start with new soil with your plants in your greenhouse. Now, if you've got them breeding in your house around your plants, the bug spray should take care of them because you're up close. You can monitor that. You can get on it every hatch until they're not hatching anymore. Um, 
Okay, so this is a fungus. I just wanted to show you some pictures of different funguses. So this is on a hydrangea, and this is a fungus. This is the type of fung what a fungus would look like also on a rose. My favorite for what I call my favorite flowers um, is to use Arbor Vitae. And it's just what you think, water and Arbor Vitae in the spray bottle. And it typically takes care of it. And you're probably saying, well, why wouldn't you use Melaleuca? There's something about the construction of these, um, the flowering leaves that are a little more delicate than like a tomato or something like that. And uh, if the sun comes out too harsh in the day, like, and, and to, oh, that's another thing. You typically want to spray these at night so that they have the entire pool of the night to ingest it and bring it into their body while they're, while the plant's resting before the sun comes up and is harsh in the day. Um, but yeah, but like if you were to spray in the morning and then the hot sun came out, you could see it's not a burning, but when you see it, you'll go, oh, that's where I sprayed. And it will heal. It will heal like within a week. But if we don't have to cause any trauma to our plants trying to get them restored, it's better to better not to do it. Um, all right here. Oh, I just really like this gal. Um, her name's Danelle and she does the homestead. I put this here. She does all kinds of different mosquito spray. See this rodent spray. She has the cute stickers and her stickers are for free on her site. Um, so I would, I would just like to promote her. I think I, I just love her. Look, and these are like really her, it's called the homesteader and I'll show, oh, this is her right here. Okay. Gardening on the homestead and, um, purely safe, natural and effective. She has these two cards you could print off. Oh, I love this. Um, she talks about how you take a string and you put it in the mixture of the water and the essential oils and you string it between the different crops of the garden to deter like the flying insects. Um, cotton cloth strips, the same thing. And then you hang them throughout the garden to keep the pests away. And then a cotton ball, she uses that for any pests that like to burrow, gophers, squirrels. Cause you know, a lot of you will probably, especially in Washington, have a ton of squirrels going after your stuff. Um, cartons and containers. You can bury the carton into the ground on top of the container and add essential oils inside of it. Um, like you could do some water. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many of you have seen where they're trying to get rid of slugs and they'll take beer because um, slugs love the salt content of beer and you pour it into like a solo cup and they crawl in during the night and you have a cup full of slugs that you can then return to the ground. Well, that's the same kind of idea. You could take a solo cup, cut it halfway and fill it with water and the oils and it will, it, and you just place it right in the ground in between your plants and it will deter. Um, let's see. And then she has her sprays, plant protection, the fungus. Um, and then that's like another list before. Um, this is just an overall, another overall list of oils that if I were going through, I, I would say to use. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna have a disclaimer for patchouli for gnats. I have not seen that worked work if you are in a high net area you want you want birds that's what you want you want birds so try and grow go to that bird article and try and get the attract the birds um like in florida they're called martins they come in and just swarm in to get like the mosquitoes um there we go okay and then oh this is like one of my most exciting favorite new things can you not see the top of that okay um this is called electroculture and if you take a stick and you wrap it with copper and you, it acts kind of like a lightning rod, please go here. This is another thing like nitrogen. And um, I, we didn't have before and after pictures of my friend's Trish. She actually lives in Texas and she was doing this. I don't know if she's on the call. Trish, if you happen to be on the call, you can um, unmute yourself. And I'd love to, I'd love to have a little testimonial here. But um, every one of these um, videos are talking about why it works. And just like we are electromagnetic people, plants thrive. It keeps it, uh, the, the, uh, the um, electricity, keeps um, the rodents away. It makes the roots grow deeper, stronger, tighter. It's so awesome. So I would say check that out. And then um, this, is, this is one of my favorite 
I'm going to call her a spiritual gardener. Um, this is a woman who's on the spectrum and her gift kind of like, um, what's her name? Temple. Um, anyway, she's a famous autistic. Temple woman. Grandin. Yes. Kind of like Temple Grandin. Michelle Small Wright is the Temple Grandin of gardening. And she actually talks to the nature spirits and she asks the plants where they want to be planted. And I, I know it sounds crazy, but if you've been a gardener and sometimes you will keep getting the feeling over and over, this plant does not want to be here. And you're like, but this is where I want this plant. Anyway, she, this tells the story of her life. This is how to garden the way she, the way she, she's just really inspirational. If you happen to be a gardener or person like me, I think you'll really enjoy it. I want to give you some tips. One of my favorite things to do before going into the garden, because you know how it can tear up your cuticles, is to take correct decks and put it before you go to the garden. Just slather up those cuticles on both hands with correct decks. And then you rub your nails over um, soap. You can see I almost always have nails so that the soap's in there. So that when you go and you just leave it in there so that when you go in to clean your hands, it comes out much cleaner and you don't have to work so hard, you know, with the scrubber brush because everybody knows you just spent the day planting. doTERRA has a really fun article that um, it's it's pretty basic, but um, I thought you might want to I thought you might want to have a gander at it. Um, okay. When people tell you planting native seeds around your city is a waste of time, remember this picture and keep seed bombing. So one of my favorite things to do is to seed bomb. And um, I am I leave tomorrow. I'm going to live in New York for a month. It's a crazy thing I'm doing that I'm very excited about. So I had to spend a lot of time figuring out what I could actually seed bomb in Central Park. So it was very fun for me to do an overall of the city and see where were places that I could actually go seed bomb because I like to be Johnny Appleseed and leave some love everywhere. At the very least, actually, I guess I could show you. <laughs> you know my crazy. I, oh, you get, there we go. I keep at all times massive sunflowers. I, I just have different seed packets, but I always have sunflower seeds on me um, in early spring because I just go around because I freaking love sunflowers. And um, I seed bomb, and all you have to do is take your foot, squish a little soil over, drop two or three seeds, squish it back, spit, go to the next spot. Yeah, it's so, and it just makes the world a happier, prettier place. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, these are some of my favorite, favorite gardening podcasts, Joe the Gardener. Um, actually, my favorite one didn't show up in the slide. <laughs> But it's called Let's Argue About Plants. And it's a it's a uh, a guy and a girl. They've known each other for years and they just totally disagree about all kinds of things like but between. But, but the great part about it is as they disagree, you get to know what you love and don't love about a certain plant, the horticulture, the, the area. A really, really good podcast for a beginning gardener is this the Beginner Gardeners podcast. Um, the My Gardener podcast, the Skinny Jean um, garden and the two minutes in the garden. These are all um, podcasts from the UK. Um, I think most of you know the largest part of my business is in the UK, but I just have ties there. Like, and they are, if you don't know this, they are the master gardeners. And I feel sad because they've never been able to work with American soil, most of them. And we have soil like no other. And it's exciting. So these are some Facebook pages not to be missed. Happy Gardens, Creative Gardening, Gardening with Essen and Essential Oils, Gardening with Essential Oils. Both of these last two sites you have to get um, accepted into. And whoever the, um, the keeper of the site is, um, somebody told me the other day that they thought it'd been at least a month since she'd accepted people in. Um, so I'm going to try and check that, track that down. And if for some reason you tried to go to get neither one of those sites and after a couple of days, you aren't welcomed in, if you will let me know, and I will personally reach out to each of them to help you get in because they're fun. It's just a bunch of, you know, it's just a bunch of us, all, all the nerds just saying, Hey, did you try this? But I promise no matter what it is that they say to try, it's going to be on that basic list. It's going to be rosemary, basil, thyme, clove, just those basic lavender, wild orange. 
Um, matter of fact, I think doTERRA should create a gardener's kit. I think that would be freaking awesome. So one of my most favorite things about gardening is just like doTERRA, it's the share. If you have a garden, you will have so much plenty. And that's why I love Thanksgiving and all the things when people are generous. And this gives us an opportunity to reach out and connect with people 